trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Before we go to the episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor, CapChase. Imagine if all your customers paid up front at the moment of signing a contract. What would that mean to you? CapChase helps fast-growing occurring revenue companies finance growth without taking on debt or dilution. Whether you want to invest in growth or R&D, CapChase turns your predictable revenue into growth capital today. CapChase has helped founders unlock hundreds of millions in financing to fuel their growth and on average extend their runway by eight months and spared upwards of 16% dilution. So go see how insanely easy it is by visiting the link in our show notes or go to capchase.com slash slush to learn more. Thanks. Let's go to the episode. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Paul and with me in the studio in Helsinki is Isa Krautio. Hi, Isa. Hi, William. It's nice to be here at the studio again. It's been a while. Yeah, it's super nice to, to be back at it. And today our guest is Nicole Quinn. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Do you want to start off by telling the, the listeners and viewers who you are and what you do? Yeah, of course. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Nicole Quinn. I'm a general partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners. Um, I split my time half and half between uh, Europe and the US. Uh, so home for me is both London and Silicon Valley. Um, I love that uh, world in between. And even during the pandemic, I have uh, also been moving back and forth. Um, so for me, You know, I grew up with a very curious mother and a very entrepreneurial father. Uh, so I was actually building online pharmacies with him um, just outside London in the 1990s. Um, and while we had about five or six different online pharmacies in different European countries, um, I would say it was a good idea, but the wrong timing. Um, and so it really taught me a lot of lessons uh, about entrepreneurship and the right timing uh, at a young age. Uh, I'm a believer that you learn more from the ones that don't work out than the ones that do. Uh, so I learned that early. I then went and spent, uh, gosh, far too many years, nearly a decade at Morgan Stanley um, because I studied math and it felt like the right thing to go into pre-financial crisis. Um, but you know what? I actually loved it because I got to cover the e-commerce companies in London and then the internet names in New York. I did the Facebook, Pandora, Groupon IPOs. So it was fascinating. But the whole time I'd been angel investing and I found myself so compelled and fascinated by that world. And I was like, how do I do this full time? So I actually left. I uh, went to Nutmeg, uh, the UK uh, fintech startup that actually just uh, sold uh, for nearly a billion, which was uh, exciting. And I have to say that company was never straight up and to the right. Lots of zigs and zags along the way to get to that uh, outcome. So uh, it was exciting working there between their A and B round. I then went out to Stanford to do an MBA and started a startup of my own, uh, worked on that for a little while, pitched it to Lightspeed um, along with about... 10, 15 other firms. And I was just blown away by mm -hmm. the type of questions that Lightspeed asked me. I felt like they were really furthering my thinking um, in every interaction I had with them. And I was like, these are the kind of thought partners that I want around the table. Um, so I joined them five, six years ago now um, and have invested in some really exciting companies. Um, you know, some in the UK, like Multiverse, Zap, Clean Liquor, uh, now Calm is uh, half in the UK, half in the US. Um, and ones in the US like um, Cameo, Zola, uh, Lunch Club, Real in the mental health space, um, and uh, also House Labs, which is Lady Gargoyle's company. So that's fun. That sounds amazing. What did they ask you? What did Lightspeed ask me? Yeah. So I had meetings with Barry, Ravi, and Jeremy. And I always say that spending time with Jeremy is like going to the gym. It breaks down your muscles and it builds them up stronger. And so you have to be somebody that uh, has a growth mindset because um, – I remember I did a presentation for Jeremy and he kind of like took the work and slid it across the table. And he was like, 
you can do better. Um, <laughs> and he was right. I could do better. And I went away for two weeks and I was like, wait a second, instead of me just pitching him my ideas, I'm going to get on the phone. I'm going to speak to these CEOs. I'm going to tell them, hey, I'm at Stanford Business School. I really want to be able to speak to you about these companies. So I got on the phone with Real Real uh, before their IPO. I guess it was actually around their Series C and got some like proprietary data. And Jeremy was like, wow, this was great access because we even can't get a meeting with uh, them when they're not fundraising. So it was great in terms of you sourcing this, getting good access, getting good diligence. And so that was much better than the first uh, piece of analysis you did. Um, and when I was a founder pitching to them, yeah, they asked me very different questions to others. They asked me, like, who is a competitor that you admire in the marketplace and why do you admire them? Um, and so very different type of questions to the others that I was being asked. You've obviously had uh, quite an illustrious career already. You've uh, you've done a very wide variety of things uh, so far. So what do you think with this experience is the most important things you've found in successful founders? Um, you know, is there some common characteristics? Is there an archetype of successful entrepreneurs that you can somehow pinpoint a few words or is it something <laughs> more mysterious than that? I would say it's something more mysterious than that. Um, so there are definitely traits that um, I look for. I, I think, uh, you know, before we were talking about um you know, a founder who has that real grit and determination and can run through walls. But I would say, like, after a few years of doing this, I've realized, like, there's so many different types of successful founders. And the much more important thing is actually, like, the founder product fit or the founder market fit. Um, that is so much more important because if you have somebody like, you know, Travis from Uber, like, his personality was very much like, it doesn't matter about anything. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm just going to keep driving to make this happen. And that's exactly the right thing that you needed for a business like Uber. Whereas if you take one of our portfolio companies, um, a firm and Max Levchin, like Max is just such a deep, like product engineering mind. And he's so thoughtful. Um, and so that's exactly the sort of person that you need to be, you know, driving that culture and driving that business and being very strategic in terms of which partnerships to take and not take and when to really, you know, put the pedal to the metal and drive forward versus like thinking through like what needs to change in the business. And so for me, I think that it is much more about, you know, the right founder or founding team to the problem that is uh, trying to be solved. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. And, and also what often is emphasized, I think teams are underemphasized, it feels like in stories, we, we have this halo effect, we want to talk about individuals, and we talk about, you know, someone from some company, but very seldom there's one founder in in any successful company or that's at least not the the more common case so how do you feel like can is it something you can build into the team um or you know the, the grit side of things or or is it because there's a lot of talk about the teams themselves that you need to have a, a good variety of skill sets variety maybe of mindsets as well but do you need someone to be kind of this you know, leader, this this kind of guy who just, or person, not a guy, but like a, like a person who who just is able to run through the walls, is able to persuade. It doesn't take no for an answer because it's very hard building most companies. I think it comes down to the obsession that the founding team has with that product, and that's what gives them that grit and determination and run through walls mentality because they're so obsessed with the problem. And so just before speaking to you right now, I was on the phone to Ewan Blair, uh, who's the CEO and founder of Multiverse. Now, Ewan, I've actually known him for many years. We used to work together at Morgan Stanley, gosh, like probably 15 years ago. And even back then, Ewan was obsessed with education. Um, he was obsessed with like, you know, changing things from, you know, a political sense, but it also like really education and like, wait a sec, like when we grew up, like universities in London were a thousand 
uh, pounds a term, so 3,000 a year. And now they're much more similar to the US, you know, it can cost like 30 to 50,000 a year um, some dollars. But it suddenly makes like the decision set of whether to go to university or not a really big one. And so, so well, wait a sec, instead, why don't you work with multiverse? And, you know, you can have this really strong cohort of others. You can go and do an apprenticeship in a really terrific company like a Google or a Microsoft or an earlier stage company. Um, and you can really work with multi -set, multiverse and get paid um, to do that rather than shelling out all this money to go to university. And so you is obsessed with this product. He's obsessed with this broader space, but he's specifically obsessed with like, what does a future version of an apprentice look like. And so I think that gives you that, um, you know, that grit because you just, you know, your life becomes all about this. And you're like, I'm not going to stop until I allow this to be as big as it can possibly be. What is what should that obsession be about? What is the sort of target of that obsession? Uh, towards what are you designing or building whatever you are building? Uh, I don't know if this is abs too abstract of a question, but like, I'll, I guess so you talked a lot about the customer and who you're also interested in. Maybe I'm kind of setting a table for your answer here, but like, <laughs> what is the uh, what, it, what should the target of the obsession be? Um. It's funny because uh, as I originally heard your question, I was thinking it is the customer. Like right. that is yeah. exactly the thing that in my mind you should be obsessed about. Um, like far too much time, I think, as a founder gets spent obsessing about the competition or internal meetings um, and like things like that that do not matter as much. You know, Jeff Bezos has a great quote about the fact that, yes, he looks at the competitors, but he's obsessed with the customer. And so that's definitely a common trait that we see amongst um, all successful founders, that they really do obsess about the customer. And so they're really obsessed with building a product that customers want. Um, my husband's a founder, and it's funny, in our bathroom, he's got all over the mirror these post-it notes, which are like, build something people want, build something people need. Uh, and I love that because he's exactly right. It's like finding that early product fit um, where customers love you so much that they're coming back time and time again. So your attention's good. They're telling their friends about it. So the referral's good. They love it themselves and they're, you know, stating that so your NPS is high. Um, they're going on social media and telling others about it, you know? So you have like terrific organic, um, driven by that word of mouth and organic social. And so if you really obsess about the customer to that extent, you're going to find like such terrific, you know, factors in the business start to come through, um, you know, such as like, hey, listen, your CAC is going to be significantly lower because you are going to have a much higher organic and referral uh, side of the business. And so we do find that that obsession kind of manifests itself in many different positive ways. You also said that you do these kind of interview trips. You you travel across across the country, talk to customers. At what point should you do that? Is that something you do? Obviously, a, a company needs to have customers for you to be able to do it. Or is it something you can also do kind of in advance? Uh, do you kind of do some research of your own to try to figure out if that idea has some kind of kind of a need? Right now is such an exciting time in consumer land. So I feel like I am just right now meeting so many interesting companies, but there was a point where it was like winter in consumer, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I'd say about three years ago. And during that time, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take some time out to um, spend a couple of weeks on the road meeting customers. And that does not mean the bubble of Silicon Valley, by the way. That means like actually getting out and speaking to people. And, you know, traveling is so important to me. Um, and so whether it's going and seeing, you know, one of our founders is in Sirencester, England. Um, I'm excited to come to your conference later in the year in Helsinki. Um, and, you know, for this particular trip, I actually went to like Bentonville, Louisiana. Um, and then I went to like North Carolina and South Carolina. And I kind of traveled around the South and speaking to people. So I went to some of the universities and spoke to the students. And I really wanted to understand like, what are the apps that you're obsessed with? Um, what are the apps that you have on your home screen? Because if you think about your home screen, those are the ones you see every day. 
And it's a little bit like out of sight, out of mind. Once an app is not on your home screen, you tend to forget about it. Whereas like the ones, think about the ones that are on your home screen, right? Those are probably, I don't know, depending on the person, right? But for me, it's like Uber because I use it so often. Um, And Facebook and Instagram and Cameo and Calm because I use Calm every single day. And so those are the apps that are really going to have such high engagement, such high retention, because you see it every day. And so I wanted to understand from people, not which apps have you downloaded, because we can kind of get that from, um, you know, data online, but like, what are the apps that are on your home screen? What are the apps you could not live without? Um, How are you thinking about different e-commerce companies? Um, I remember someone said to me, I trust Amazon. Amazon is my friend. I was like, wow, Amazon is going to be taking a lot more market share than they even have done. If that's the way that people think about like the trust that an Amazon package will come and they do not have that same belief in others. So hopefully Shopify is changing that for other e-commerce brands now. Um, But, you know, it's interesting. That trust is just such an important factor. And that's like some of the areas that I was really diving into with people around their customer behavior. It sounds almost obvious. I mean, it is. It does sound obvious. Like think about the customer in a sense, and I think if everyone is trying to achieve that if they're trying their best. What are some of the uh, main things you notice uh, in founders or or founding teams where that attention gets diverted to something else? Uh, why does the customer lose the center role? of, of uh, like the, the number one priority of, of, uh, of design? I think it's because sometimes um, founders believe that they have the customer love, um, which is also called product market fit, um, before they actually do. And so often people will think, okay, so we have the customer love, now it's time, pedal to the metal, let's start scaling. And they start raising a lot of venture money and start scaling. And then they realize, wow, our CAC is really high. Wow, like we're not actually able to acquire people in the same way that we were before. Um, and it's because like you didn't kind of go back to basics and think, okay, well, let's really obsess about the customer. And so I think, unfortunately, people start scaling too fast before they have like the proper groundwork and the foundation in place. Um, and then it is other areas like, too focused on the competition. Like it's good to kind of like, you know, know what the competition's doing, um, but not to spend too much time on it um, because you should be, you know, out there leading in front um, and not worrying about what the others are thinking. Um, you know, Calm's a great example of that, actually. You know, there was always Headspace, but we never really worried about what Headspace were doing. We're like, they can do their own thing. You know, we're doing a great job in meditation. And hey, actually, our customers are meditating at night. Well, maybe that's because they're trying to get to sleep. So why don't we introduce sleep stories? Why don't we work with more celebrities and have Matthew McConaughey read you a sleep story? And so, you know, we introduced new areas just like leading out in front. Um, and so, you know, that's why now Calm is such a great brand because they have always be very, been very authentic and innovative in the way that they've been driving these products. Um, and then the other things are, you know, like just spending a lot of time on internal meetings um, and areas like that. Um, And so I love it when the CEO is just really obsessed with the customer and getting on the phone to the customer, really better understanding like what the customer wants and needs and is saying about you. Um, And just has a really sort of product led mindset uh, in speaking to the customer and then building that. Yeah, it feels sometimes even it can the reason you don't do that is just you don't want to get the negative feedback. It's like very humane. You don't want to hear someone hate your company. Uh but even though that's a gift and that's you know the the information you you really need to need to get. Uh but it, it can be very humane. Like I don't want anyone to to speak badly of, of the stuff I'm doing. So well, by the way, that is such a great point. And that's why we invest in CEOs who have a growth mindset. Like that to me is such an important thing. We almost look at founders who like want to hear the criticism. I like, want to hear the constructive feedback because they're like, that's the way I grow. That's the way I learn and grow and get better. And my company gets better. So we love folks that have that growth mindset. Yeah. Bad news is good news. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, taking it back still maybe to the grit question and you mentioned Calm uh, a few times now and, and you're obviously invested with them as well. Um, but do you think there's a risk uh, of confusing this grit 
uh, mindset and this run through wall mentality with kind of this hero mindset that you need to be as a founder invincible you don't sleep you never have problems you are the one who should have you know tackle all the problems you should always be strong all this kind of this kind of toxic way maybe at the end of the day to to also neglect your own health as a founder and it seems this maybe topic and this discussion has you know become more and more relevant now in in only in recent years uh, back in the days it used to be it feels like no one really questioned you know the stereotypical <laughs> entrepreneur who works for 100 hours a week and and does all that i mean it's something we think about a lot um we've invested in an incredible company in the uk called zap um zapp and it's in the quick commerce space um it's really leading the way in england um and the founders are incredible um you know we met them in their prior company go butler and they're such hard workers and sometimes i will say to uh, navid the ceo hey where does that like i'm messaging you my afternoon this is like you know very late for you in europe and he's like well zap is 24/7 so i'm 24/7 <laughs> and i'm like okay that comes because he loves the business you know and he really wants to be doing it um but i think that he's also balancing that with like okay well you know i also need to sleep and um speaking to his co-founder who's very sensible um around you know just sort of really driving the business forward um but also realizing this is a marathon not a sprint um and so they've done a tremendous job around that um but listen like you know we have definitely seen firsthand a lot of our founders have um or you know a couple of our founders over the years have come up against you know mental health um struggles um and i would say it's really difficult um i mean i actually uh did a coaching course a year ago um it was a year long coaching qualification so now i'm a certified coach because i believe that it is a board member's role to also be a coach to your ceos because like for us we need to help you as a ceo be the best version of yourself and i really reach your potential um and going back to that it's a marathon not a sprint um so hopefully you know it's like a marriage hopefully we're working together for the next 10 plus years um, um, and I'm able to, you know, help you on the upside, mitigating the downside, um, but also, you know, knowing yourself inside out. Like, what are your weak areas? Because we want to help you to be able to, like, hire a team around you so that you have complementary others. I'm a big believer, like, build on your strengths. Don't worry about your weaknesses. We can hire for your weaknesses. But, like, you should just continue to make yourself better, uh, like, make your strengths even stronger, um, and so, you know, that's definitely where Lightspeed helps. We have two different hiring teams to come in and help folks with, uh, with hiring all different levels in the organization. Um, and so I think that, uh, it's something that I personally invest in actions over words, right? Like that's why we've invested in mental health companies like Calm and Real, um, and we'll continue to be doing so. That's great. Um, what other sort of, um, you talked a lot about the sort of support that you can give to founders. What kind of relationship do you build with them? Uh, what, what is the uh, what is your philosophy there? And like, what what should be the, I guess, more personal VC founder relationship like? Yeah. So um, the team is very special to us at Lightspeed. Uh, one of our values at Lightspeed is actually uh, one Lightspeed, which means. We all work together and it means um, when you work with Lightspeed, you work with everybody. Um, and so whatever problem you come up against, um, if I don't know the answer, I'm going to make sure that I don't stop until I find that answer or find the very best person for you to speak to. Um, and maybe you are you know, building and Facebook's copied you and you need to speak to Evan Spiegel about when Snapchat was copied by Facebook. And so we will introduce you um, because I think he's the best person to, you know, speak to about that because, my gosh, they have definitely succeeded after Facebook came in and copied them. Um, and so equally at Lightspeed, I'm really excited about the fact that we have over, you know, the years built up a very strong founder success team. Um, we are focused on quality over quantity. And so as a result, we have a very senior experienced team um, who can help with 
growth marketing, your narrative, PR, um, hiring a top tier team across all levels, you know, from C-suite right through the organization. Um, We actually recently hired um, a chap called Sam Woolley. He was um, formerly uh, Riviera Partners, who are the best out here um, in product and engineering. And so he's really here to kind of drive our technical talent team um, and help companies hire the best engineers. We also um, have uh, folks on the growth hacking side who can really kind of help our companies be like, okay, now you have found that customer love, that product market fit. Now let, let's kind of run through all these different growth hacking techniques. Um, one of our guys um, on that team actually took the hill from 2 million to 80 million users, um, then did something similar at uh, Whisper. And so he's helped you know, lots of our companies like Calm and Cameo and others over the years. And so we probably actually have about 40 people on that team now. Um, so we have like a really big team, um, but it's like all these different individual units. Um, and we make sure that, you know, I as like your partner, I'm still your number one. So we won't say, okay, great, you know, go off and find people in this organization. I will be your number one contact and like really better understand what is like, what's going to really move the needle for your business? And like for those areas that will move the needle, then I will make the right intros um, so that it's being very conscious of your time. Um, I'm a big believer that, you know, what gets management's time, attention and focus has the greatest chance of success. And so we need to make sure that, you know, that CEO's time is being spent uh, in the most worthwhile places. I think that's a cool model. I haven't heard of that per se being that active and that big for VC firms. I don't know if, if it's common or not, uh, but do, do all these people like work full time for Lightspeed and then you just implement them to different places or do they do something different at the side as well? Yes, uh, everybody works full time. Um, and even though you know, we have a pretty sizable team um, of you know 30 to 40 people, we really have a strong view that it's quality over quantity. And so we don't hire a bunch of younger people to do hiring, we go to like the very best recruiting firms like Riviera, like SPMB, and get like the head of consumer recruiting to come and do our consumer recruiting, or, you know, the head of Riviera to come and do product engineering. And I think that's very important, because it's also saying to a um, saying to the, you know, the CEOs that we work with, hey, instead of you spending $100,000 um, on you know, these recruiting firms, we'll come to us and you know, we can kind of help you with your strategy. And then often you know, they do want to work with recruiting firms as well, but it's so much better to like, you know, have all of these resources available to them. Um, I think that you know, those things are super important. And also a lot of them have uh, great resources in Europe as well, uh, which is increasingly important for our US team coming to Europe and also our, you know, Europe teams really building out there. Yeah, maybe you should get that team to to found a company of their own. Imagine that. <laughs> love having them at light speed. Yeah. <laughs> but keep them focused. Yeah. Um, do founders worry generally about something too much? What do they sort of overlook? So... That's a great question that comes back to you know, some of the areas that we were talking about before. And I think it is really thinking through, um, you know, not doing as much in the way of focusing on the competition, focusing on internal meetings um, and just spending a lot more time focusing on the really high level hires um, and like making sure that you have the strongest people in the organization. One of our companies, Real, I love it. She says that she doesn't want to even have a B player in the way of an EA. She wants to make sure that every single person who has any touch point with the company is an exceptional person, really extraordinary. Um, And so just keeping that bar very, very high from the C-level execs right through to the EAs. um, And so that I think is something that's super important. Um, And founders, you know, maybe you know, don't spend the time thinking about that in terms of like, listen, like your culture, it starts right from the word go. Um, It starts, you know, from the CEO and it filters through. And so we've got to make sure that those early people that you hire are extraordinary. Um, And so I think that uh, that's something that founders need to spend more time focused on. 
we always love a bit of controversy. Yeah. So <laughs> is there something that you think most people or maybe other VCs even uh, would disagree with you about in terms of you know building companies or wisdom in terms of, of succeeding? Yes, I've seen a few blog posts recently saying that people only invest in big markets and they really need a big TAM. I completely disagree on that. Um, I'm a big believer that I'd much rather go after a founder who's building um, in a small market where there's many tangential markets. It's a little bit like bowling, right? Like you throw the ball and you hit a pin and you want that pin to then knock down the other pins. So that eventually they all come down. But it's so important to just focus on that first pin because it's a little bit like, I don't know whether you guys have read the book, Crossing the Chasm. I love that book. Um, and it's about the fact that, hey, if you target a niche audience, then it's much easier to cross the chasm and become mass when you're targeting a smaller group, because those smaller pe- groups, those groups, they talk to one another a lot more and they share on social media with one another. And so you're going to be able to like capture a much greater percentage of that smaller audience um, and then go mass from there. So I really don't like the idea of like, okay, we're going to be everything to everyone and we're going after this huge market and our market is everyone. Um, it's like, no, let's focus in on a smaller market and then knock over the other bowling pins. Yeah, no, I think that's a great, great point. And it's, it can feel maybe a, a bit intimidating at first also not being everything to everyone and, you know, to maybe narrowly defining your target market. But at the end of the day, you can't, it seems you can't become truly big by, by trying to, you know, just scatter all around. You you really need to find something that someone or or some people, there's this like first hundred, first thousand fans concept as well, which I guess is, is pretty much the same idea. And uh, once you get that traction and you get that, I guess that's product market fit in its purest form, then after that you can, you can find other verticals, other customers as well. You know what? I love that. And just to give a couple of examples of what you're talking about, I feel like it can be based on either geography um, or sector. And so on the geography side of things, you know, Zap, we started very, very narrow. We started in like West London in a small borough and we really just wanted to be in front of everybody in that area. And then we expanded to London and now we're in three different countries. Um, And so we just kept expanding and like kept knocking over bowling pin by bowling pin. Um, And so I think that is exactly the right way to grow um, and just sort of proving you can do it in multiple markets. And the other one that kind of grew by sector is Calm. And so with them, you could say originally the meditation market was small, right? Like 10 years ago when they started, how many people meditated? It was a small market. And now their market is everybody who wants to go to sleep. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah. significant market um and listen i love being read to sleep by stephen fry telling me about the provence fields in uh france um the lavender fields in provence rather every night so it's uh it's a much bigger market now yeah no it's true things are usually things kind of become a thing or a cool when they're small in-group things what do, why would you want to be mainstream from the start you don't want to get that bad funk, bad mainstream funk on you too early. <laughs> you are preaching to the converted. I completely agree with you. I mean, at Lightspeed, we always look for companies that are like quickly becoming part of popular culture. Um, but I do think that very much starts in the more niche audiences first. Yeah. I think it's important. Do you think that founders would benefit from maybe having some experience with building something smaller? something more hands-on, something maybe not as scalable um, to kind of have that mindset, that understanding of also doing things that do not scale. Uh, this is kind of the the idea I've, I've had for, for myself actually is that like maybe start off or what I have been doing personally is, is building things that necessarily don't scale to the level of Facebook. They can become real businesses who serve real uh, a lot of real customers every year, but they can't become, you know, at the, the biggest tech platform. But kind of those skill sets and those, the things you get from understanding that really seems like are that, that, that maybe like feels the, like the fundamentals that you would need in in building any company and and getting any company off the ground. 
Yeah, I think that's great that you're doing that. I think that um, in the early days, that's so important. I mean, we often invest in multiple time founders. And so if you think about Michael Acton Smith, before Calm, he did Moshi Monsters. Um, and that did scale, but then, you know, hit a ceiling. Um, and Alex too did the million dollar homepage, um, you know, and just sold off little pictures. Oh, he did that one. Um, oh, that's yeah, a legendary that thing. Oh, I love it. The million dollar exactly. homepage? No, I missed this. What is uh, this? It's the greatest web page oh, ever. I'll Google this after the show yeah. right away. It's definitely not scalable, right? Yeah. Because it literally only has a million <laughs> pixels. And so you can't even go beyond that point. Um, and so um, they both did that first. But they built incredible skills and learnings through those companies that didn't work out. And then they took those learnings and then, you know, applied them to Calm now. And so it's like, you know, whenever we come again, come up against a challenge, it's like, ah, oh, that's another one of those is seen that before, um, you know, in the prior companies. And so, you know, we know how to deal with it. Um, and so that's, uh, I think that's great what you're doing. That was great, great to hear. Um uh... But um, yeah, and it also seems like, um, or, or this is saying like that if your first company becomes really big, it would have become much, much bigger if it was your third company or something like that. Yeah, that's not accurate. That's not an accurate quote, but something like that at least. Maybe to, to round off, uh, it's always interesting to hear about VCs because it seems like a very generalist job in a way. You need to understand a lot of things to be able to be a good investor. Um, what is something you cultivate all the time or every day, even something you practice, uh, what is something you try to, to do to, to become a better VC? The number one thing that I do is, uh, use the most important resource that all of us have, uh, which is, you know, these, the pair of ears mm, yeah. that we have, um, I'm a big believer that you have two ears and one mouth and you should use them in that proportion. Um, That's so, really well said. Yeah, That's nice. You guys have heard me talking more than I ever talk in the last half an hour. Usually I'm just asking questions. We're very happy. Yeah, that's did. the point yeah. of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it usually is, you know, hearing the incredible like insights from founders and hearing the nuggets of the future. Um, that's what I love about this job. Um, but I do think it's so important to, you know, really be listening um, and to like double down and like, okay, well, wait, am I hearing you right? This is what I'm hearing. Um, and so that's the number one thing I do. Um, you know, other resources, it's, you know, great to read terrific newsletters. My partner, Alex Tausig, writes one called uh, Firehose. Um, and so I love that. Um, but also the interesting thing about what you guys said is like VC is a generalist job. I agree with that, but I deeply believe in specialism. And so I think because I invest in consumer, but like consumer in the broader sense of the word, consumer fintech to consumer healthcare to social and marketplaces, I think it helps you bring just like more deeper insights when you're in a board meeting. Like specializing in that space um and so that's why you know love companies and working with them on the boards and being able to like bring those insights over the years to them uh so specialism is also key agreed Great. yeah it's been very enjoyable thank you so very, much very for, for you. joining the podcast and sharing your your wisdom and your your nuggets as well it's been super interesting Thank you both. Such wonderful questions and looking forward to seeing you, uh, I think, first and second of December. That's right. Likewise, in Helsinki, uh, where the weather is always very nice. So <laughs> look forward in to December. seeing you as well. And yeah, thank you to everyone who tuned in, uh, listened or watched and see you in the next episode. Take care until then. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.